Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to continue uh, looking at M.L. Andreessen's uh, letters to the churches. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the precious time that we have in fellowship with you and with one another. And we're thankful for the week, for the difficulties that we face, for the challenges, and for the promise and hope that you give us as we cling to Jesus. We pray that you can forgive us for our sins and help us to be mindful of your presence and to hear your voice and uh, follow your direction and leading according to thy word. And we pray, Lord, that you can bless each person uh, who's following these studies. Um, we know, Lord, that we have much to learn, much to unlearn. And we need your presence here now as we read and study and discuss together. We pray for those that can't be here, that wish to be. We ask, Lord, that you can bless them. And be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again. Amen. Now, this this part that we're reading here, so to give just a little bit of re review, some people might be watching this video who haven't seen the other parts. So M.L. Andreessen, Seventh-day Adventist minister, near the later, latter part of his life, I mean, he, he has actually spent time with Ellen White for a few months uh, when he was a young minister, so 1958. He's um, writing this uh, letters to the churches, telling them about what had happened with the evangelical conferences uh, between our leadership and um, primarily um, Donald Barnhouse and Walter Martin. Walter Martin wrote a book called The Kingdom of the Cults with an appendix called The Puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism, where he claims that Adventism used to be a cult, but no longer is. And this first book I read after I became an Adventist um, was the entire book, Kingdom of the Cults, but obviously I focused quite a bit on the appendix. Um, so I understood that uh, our leaders, based on what the evangelicals said, uh, that our leaders had compromised our beliefs. And so I knew that very early on. And I also knew, of course, quite a bit about the, the issues dealing with the 2300 days from that book. And so that's always been a study of mine, which we're not studying right now, but it's, um, so when I became an Adventist, I was aware of the issues within Adventism and have spent a lot of time, you know, questioning things. I didn't just accept everything that Adventists said. I studied, I went to the library. Back then, you know, we didn't have computers. So, um, you know, I'd spend a lot of time at the public library reading the Jewish encyclopedia and the Catholic encyclopedia and all kinds of books and doing research on Adventism. It wasn't until, you know, I really, until about uh, 2010, that when I came in contact with this message that uh, we're a part of, that I really became a solid Adventist. Now, I was always solid on righteousness by faith. I shouldn't say always. I mean, God had to teach me a lot of things, but because I didn't, I didn't buy into all the new books, I didn't literally buy them, but I also didn't buy into what was being said in them uh, because Ellen White, her writings were quite clear. And also I read all of Jones and Wagner's uh, published works. And uh, now I became familiar with the evangelical conferences from our point of view. So originally I just read their point of view from Walter Martin's point of view. But I ran into the letters for the churches uh, probably about 1985, maybe 84, somewhere in there, um, that, I, that I, I got a copy of his letters to the churches and read them at that time. So it'd be a couple of years after I was baptized. So first I, I, I heard it from their side, and then I heard it from Andreasen's side. The church didn't seem to be too concerned about this. I mean, they believed that it was the right direction to go. Many of the ministers I knew, the guy who baptized me, um, he would have been much more sympathetic with uh, the even with the leadership in their connection with the evangelicals. 
But anyway, when we're looking at this here, where we were reading, Andreasen is having a difficult time accepting that what he's hearing is true, right? That that the leadership is acting in this way becomes hard for him to fathom. So I'm just going to read some of this that I'd read before, but uh, it says, let the reader ponder. We have a sane leadership according to their own estimation. And we also have a lunatic fringe of wild-eyed irresponsibles. The same leadership is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold di- views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination. Now, we heard very similar things like that in regard to the 2520. Now, is there a lunatic fringe uh, within Adventism? Well, there's always a lunatic fringe everywhere. I mean, you know, if you have a job, there's probably some lunatic fringes at a job, you know. Sometimes there's lunatic fringes in the fam- in families, right? There, there's always people who are unbalanced in some way, but it's not really profitable to label people. As, at least when it comes to understanding whether something's true or not, labeling someone as a lunatic, as a heretic, as, as rebellious, and so forth, never does any good. It doesn't actually help the cause of good. If you are on the right side, it wouldn't help the cause of good. Now, often it's used when people are on the wrong side of truth. That is, it's much more common when you don't have truth on your side uh, to use other strategies uh, to deal with what you determine to be error. Right? Because if you have truth on your side, you just present truth and you don't worry about it. God takes care of his truth. You don't need any sort of special human intervention because uh, truth is very powerful. And, and and so we could see that when, you know, things were being brought to the church that, that sometimes are true, sometimes they're things that aren't true, but sometimes there's a mixture of truth and error as well. So um, one thing Satan will do is he, you know, let's say, we look at something like the 2520 because most of us are involved in that. Uh, to some degree, right? So we believe in the 25, 20 year prophecy. And now, obviously I'm balanced, right? I mean, I was never an extremist. I mean, we all think we're balanced. So <laughs> that doesn't really mean too much. Um, but when I when I looked at the situation, I definitely wasn't attacking the church. I didn't accept the 25, 20 because the church didn't like it. I wasn't trying to you know, call the church Babylon. I wasn't trying to attack the church in any way. I was simply just looking for truth. But there were some who uh, used the 2520 as part of an attack on the church, made it more difficult for people like me, you know, because I'm not really political. I don't believe that that's how you do things. Yeah, Kelly, you have a comment on that? Amen. That made it difficult yeah. for many, myself included. And you are yeah. Not. yeah. So the thing about it is is labeling a lunatic fringe, recognizing that that whenever you have truth, there's always going to be people who hold that truth in some way that's not profitable. It's true of the Sabbath, right? It's true of the, the state of the dead, it's true of all of our doctrines. There are there are people who become Seventh day Adventists who chase people away with the truth because of of how they approach presenting things. So labeling somebody a lunatic cringe isn't isn't really very helpful. What you really need to do is address the ideas that are being presented in an open way. And so you could see why the leadership, instead of addressing basically their error because they were wrong in what they were doing, they're going to use these types of tactics. And we should never use these types of tactics, right? They're, they're, they're never profitable. They're never going to help us. Even if we think something is, is outright heresy, it's not the approach that we use in order to counter it. We, especially if we have authority, we have power to stop something from happening. A good example of this, uh, when um, 
Now, the first time I went to a light bearers camp meeting, so this would have been 1986. There was a young guy there who, who later became a pastor, a guy named John Whitcomb. Um, I think it will, it recently he's had his credentials removed. But he was pretty fanatical back then. And he was one of the speakers at Light Bears Camp Meeting. But he was speaking about, um, if I remember correctly, like country living, right? So he, but he was not allowed to speak about his theology. And he was a member of, uh, if I remember correctly, this is a long time ago, uh, Life Supports was the organization he was a part of. And they were teaching that uh, they hadn't sinned since March. So this was in like May or June or something. So there's been a few months that they had stopped sinning. And uh, so it's it's quite an interesting story. I'm not going to go into the details of everything. But what ended up happening is a whole group of people ended up going to his campsite. Because back then it was pretty rustic kind of camp meeting. Everybody you know, had trailers or tents and and uh, so they went to his campsite. We had about maybe 40, 50 people gathered around to hear him talk about what he believed. So by, you know, sort of warning people not to speak to him about it, that he's not allowed to speak about it. I mean, it's just going to help it promote it. Right. You know, if they had just done nothing Amen. alone, probably nobody would have even known that he had these views, you know, maybe a few friends or something. But you tell, well, you tell Adventists not to listen to somebody and they're going to show up. I mean, I remember that's why a lot of people went to see Ty Gibson when he came to Alberta because the churches were warning everybody not to go here. So everybody's like, oh, we better go hear this guy. <laughs> right. So so one is I'm not saying that you should ignore a person. But one, I, I do believe that we need to interact. And we had this discussion yesterday. Now, there are situations where people it's not really that type of issue. I mean, there is evil. There's people who are just bad people. And and we, we don't want to get those two things confused. Some people are just misled, but they're nice people. They, they want to know the truth. Uh, you know, they, they have some wrong ideas. All of us do. And sometimes they have the wrong ideas. And the reason why they're in a position of rebellion is because once they get these ideas, they're not treated very well, Right. So if, if they're not treated well, you, you just actually help, you know, that person dig in, right? You know, where if you just kind of, you know, talk with them and listen to what they had to say, and you didn't agree, you don't have to fight with them. You don't have to start using, um, you know, force, you know, to stop them from speaking to others or something. You know, it's pretty simple just to present the truth and, and to give that person an opportunity to share what they believe. I, I do think that's important, as long as it's done in, in a correct way. Obviously, the example Felix brought up, you know, where somebody's really seeking to do evil um, and to disturb, uh, that's a different thing. But you can't just say that everybody who has a different idea is somehow being disruptive because they think something that, that you know, maybe you don't agree with. Right? And that, but that's the way the church, you know, tries to deal with these things then I don't think it's profitable. I don't think it helps. So so this is the situation uh, that he is in, right? How does he react to this? And how is the church treating him, right? Um, you know, this longstanding minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, well-respected, who now is questioning uh, what they're doing, and they're just going to put the pressure on him. One is they're going to take away his credentials eventually. Okay, so he says, some will object that this is only what the evangelicals say of their leaders. The fact remains that our men have never protested against these accusations. My own case makes clear of our leaders, I should say. So so they're just saying, the evangelicals are saying this about our leaders. But the, the leaders aren't changing. They're not protesting against these accusations. My own case makes clear that without any trial or hearing, I was to be brought before the tribunal, not for a hearing, but to be condemned without a hearing by the men who had appointed themselves as judges. It is to be had in mind that this was before the General Conference of 1958, before the new theology had been officially accepted, and before the denomination had an opportunity to express itself on the subject. All public criticism must, must cease. If I did, if it 
If I did not cease, I will undoubtedly bring up the matter. It, it will undoubtedly bring up the matter of your relationship to the church. This was an ultimatum. And so we've seen similar things happen to people that we know. We've seen people disfellowship. Uh, these ultimatums are brought up. Uh, whatever this person is teaching or whatever they're doing or any sort of criticism is, is seen as some kind of rebellion. And a voice is not going to be given to that person. So it's an abuse of power, right? And all of us can do this in, in various ways. So we may not have uh, the power of the church, but we can do it um, even on a, on a personal level. Right. So, you know, I've used this illustration before, but, um, you know, even in how we present something. So even if, if I'm doing a presentation, I don't want to manipulate people to see things the way that I see them. I want them to to have the information and to make to make their choice, their decision and their in their own personal study. So. You know, some people use psychological tactics to convince people. And one is a style that is more entertaining and sort of dramatic and evangelical type of things can actually ma manipulate people. Even emotional appeals are a type of manipulation. But there's this illustration, which which I always think about, uh, where, you know, a pastor is is doing a sermon, right? He's preparing his notes and he says, here, my arguments are weak you know, raise my voice and wave my arms dramatically because I don't have good arguments. So I have to use some kind of demonstration or maybe add some kind of story or something, you know, some emotional appeal, right? So we need to know when our arguments are weak and we need to share that with people. We need to be open and honest about what we believe. And, you know, on the YouTube videos, you can see some of these where there's people sort of uh, constantly, you know, berating me, telling me I'm ignorant, I'm stupid, I'm lost, Jesus doesn't listen to me, all these types of things. It's not a very effective way to reach somebody if you think someone is in error, to mock them and call them names and so forth, right? Which we all should understand. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the way things are done. And that is when we're dealing with an issue, we should always be trying to win that person. Okay. Now in this situation, so, I mean, we can relate to what he's, he's going through here because all of us have experienced this just on some level. Uh, how did I react to this? As any man would, here was a usurpation of authority. I wrote that I was a man of peace and that I could be reasoned with, but not threatened. I felt and now feel, and I now feel that this denomination is facing the apostasy foretold long ago, that our leaders are following the exact procedure which the spirit of prophecy outlined they would follow, and that I have a duty which I must not shrink. I regret very much that our leaders, by their actions, have made it possible for our enemies to bring deserved reproach to God's cause. In my earlier letters, I mentioned again and again that our enemies would sooner or later discover our weakness and make capital of it. I pleaded with our leaders to make amends for what had been done, but without results. We are now reaping what we have sown. Okay, so let's think about this. Now, M. L. Andreessen, a well-respected minister, uh, near you know the end of his life, he's um, I believe he's retired at this point. Obviously, he has friends close within the denomination who inform him about what's happening, but he's going to be the one that stands up to be to be counted, right? Okay, so he's going to be the one who's put in the firing line, and and often we see this, you know, I've seen so many times where uh, people are saying, you know, you need to go and deal with this problem, right? And uh, you know, you feel like that person out there on no man's land getting fired at. Nobody's there with you. And and I think to a large degree, that's what happened to Emil Andreessen. And, and of course, because he's being threatened, there's other people, maybe younger ministers who might sympathize with him, but they don't want to lose their position, right? So these bullies end up 
controlling things, right? Uh, now the little saying that, you know, door slammers run the church. The people who make the big fuss, the bullies, they tend to be the ones in charge. So the more meek and mild-mannered Christ-like people tend not to be, right? They just don't, uh, uh, they don't, they don't, and, and El there's a statement in Spirit of Prophecy where she talks about this. I uh, can't think of how it's worded. But basically, at some point, you know, these people will stand up, right? They, these people that have sort of stayed quiet uh, will stand up um, to what's happening. But, you know, the church doesn't want to hear about uh, this type of stuff. Isn't that always the case, though, Theodore? When there's something in the church, it's always put to somebody who wants to speak and um, or who will speak and I remember in uh, in the Werribee Church when I was there a long time ago, and I was there was a man who was put up to be an elder of the church, but he hadn't been a deacon, and I I opposed him, and um, and I I made it open, but he he never forgave me. It's uh, whereas other other people were all there saying he shouldn't, but no one would would say anything, and you know it's uh, it goes against biblically what we have in our heart. If you've got something to say, we need to say it to the person directly. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had two men that stuck with him no matter what. They would fight back to back, and they won many, many battles. Because when the when the uh, they say you know who your friends are when the fists are flying, it's um, when the trouble's there. You know we have to realize how much Jesus is our best friend, and no matter what, if we're consulting him and walking with him and talking with him and do his will, we will never we we'll never fail. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. In my next letter, I shall recount the efforts I have made to get a hearing. Not, not a secret hearing, but a public hearing. And if that is not thought best, a private hearing, but one that would be recorded and of which I would get a copy. In this, I have failed. I shall give the documented reasons for my failure to get a recorded hearing. I've been asked what I expect to accomplish. I received hundreds of letters pledging support if I will only do certain things. I answer very few letters, as it is physically impossible for me to enter into correspondence. I've received many offers of advice and direction, but I don't want to involve others. I've had all manner of motives attributed to me, some good people apparently failing to understand that to attribute motives is judging. Also, it seems impossible for some to understand that doctrine in itself is important enough to furnish motive to protest. In this crisis we are now in, it would be cowardice for me to fail to come up to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Now, um, this reminds me of the situation that we have with uh, Conrad Vine and Ivor. What's the guy's name? Ivor right? Myers? Yeah. So he he ended up basically condemning Conrad Vine, right? I, I don't know if you heard about that. No, I didn't, but as I well know. as... Uh... Uh, guy with the high pitched voice, Bohr, Stephen Bohr, as well, has come out against him. Yeah. And, and what people do, I mean, I never understand the idea of coming against a person, right? And you can understand why. One is we, we can't judge a person's heart, we don't know what's going on in their minds. And, and you could say, well, well they do this, so I know what's going on in their minds. Uh, it, you know. it appears like it's going against Conrad, but you know they're they're going against the idea. But Conrad's identified with the idea because he mentioned it. No, he, uh, Ira Meyer no. said basically he is satanic rebellion. He, he compared oh. it to Satan, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. yeah what so does that I mean? Guess. That Ivor Ivor Myers is satanic in rebellion. Well, I don't know why. Well, the accuser of the brethren, right? Yeah, well, yes. And, and, but, you know, to talk about, um, but this is the, the problem that we have as people, right? It's easy just to say, well, this person, you know, they're this or they're that, right? Because they did this or that. I mean, I've been called Judas. I've been called all kinds of things, uh, you know, and, and the people who make these accusations aren't going to spend the time talking, right? Like, how much time did Ivor Myers spend talking to Conrad Vine? I don't know, right? Maybe he didn't talk to him at all. Uh, 
and and this excuse that's often made is well somebody made the statements public publicly so i don't need to follow matthew 18 right that's sort of the argument that's been made in the movement these are public statements i don't need to talk to the person now you can talk about the idea right you don't have to talk to the person if you're talking about what somebody's saying like theologically that's not really an issue it's when statements are made about the person's character and their motives uh, that's quite a different matter right that they should be silenced in some way or you know you understand what i'm saying it we, we so easily attack individuals that we don't agree with and it, it it's shameful it, it's not christ-like it, it doesn't accomplish anything Amen. you know but it's it's our nature. That's you know, we we just it's easy to fall, find faults in others, but we really need to examine ourselves. And and it's so to me it's so much easier personally, you know, if 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 somebody has an idea to just discuss it with them, like instead of discussing it with everybody else and making videos about how this person is wrong. I mean, and you can see on how we've approached in our studies dealing with Jeff's letters or dealing with different things we'll call in studies and so forth. We haven't, we haven't made an attack on the people as individuals. And we've tried to give a fair account of what they're presenting and to examine it fairly and make no judgment about a person's salvation or whether, you know, they're being led of God or Satan. I just don't think even if they are being led of Satan, it doesn't really help me to evaluate that. I'm not the judge. They might be. They might not. There could be other factors, you know, involved, right? It, do, it doesn't help anybody, right? That's all I'm trying to say. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anyone else. Nobody's benefited by attacking individuals' motives and character. Okay, so, um, so he's had all manner of motives attributed to him. Some good people apparently failing to understand that to attribute motives is judging, right? So that's the, the point there. We, we don't judge in that way. We can be discerning about an idea, but we can't, we can't judge the heart. And, uh, and he's saying that um, there is a crisis. And if in a crisis, you know, all that takes is, a, I can't remember how it goes. Something about a good man do nothing or something. It's just a common saying. You know, we have to do something in a crisis. That is, there's a crisis. And to stand up and be noticed in a crisis um, is the right thing to do. It would be cowardice not to. Right? So he had to do this. He had to write these letters. I've had three delegations come to me to plead with me to do something practical. In effect, they said, we are with you, but you are not going at the matter in a practical way. The moment we take our stand with you, we may and probably will lose our position. They were ministers, right? So this is the idea that uh, there are some people who will stand up, but other people. Now, what do they mean by practical? Before we go on and read, what, what do you think people mean by practical? So they don't want to lose their position. So what is this practical word uh, disguising? I call it compromise. And pleasing. Okay. Well, I, I think that could be part of it. But what sometimes people mean by this, and what I think that they're, they're indicating is we need to do it, you know, cleverly, right? We, we have to, we have to do this in a sort of a secret way. We need to manipulate the situation behind the scenes, right, without being noticed. Does, does that make sense, what I'm saying? That's what people mean by practical. Is that Christ's way of doing things? No. See, you could put, instead of practical, political, policy, right? Then people agree with what I'm saying here. Can the truth be furthered, be promoted properly by these types of methods, by working sort of behind the scenes, like not really showing your true colors, trying to influence people in, 
in, in various ways, individuals, but not being, not standing up. It, it's not biblical, is it, Theodore? The Bible says if we've got something to say, we go to that person and say it, and then we, if they don't agree, you take the person with you. It's, it's not biblical. You need to be straightforward in your mm-hmm. communication. Now, I ha- in, in the situation that I was involved with the American and Canadian groups, uh, one of the guys in the group, he said that I needed to be, what he was saying is I need to be more political, right? That I need to know how to say the right things to the right people, that I'm not skilled in, in doing this. And I said, I know how to manipulate people if I wanted to, but I refuse. Amen. Refuse to be uh, disingenuous. I refuse to pretend to be something I'm not. Now, now, some people think that's foolish, right? They think, well, everybody needs to pre- pretend. You can't just, you know, be straightforward and be yourself and expect to get anywhere, right? Well, you can't from a political point of view, I agree, right? So I actually understand how to play that game, right? I see other people do it. I know what they do. I just refuse to do it. Amen. I don't think it, it I don't think it's Christ-like. It, to me, it's being dishonest. That's that's the way that I would look at it. You know, I can't pretend. And But that's what they mean by practical, right? So if you had something to offer us, if you would start another movement which we could join, we would go with you. But to be left stranded without any prospect is unrealistic. You'll never get anywhere unless you have something to offer. So here, some of these people are saying... <laughs> To start some kind of movement, you know, something that we can have support and financial support. And is this the way that Christ would want us to operate? Right. This type of politicizing and and, uh, positioning people, uh, positioning yourself to be in 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 some kind of uh, position right within the movement, positioning yourself within the movement. This is what a lot of people were doing. And, and one of the, the, the reasons why I believe personally this, I mean, I could be wrong, but one of the reasons I believe that um, I was seen as a threat was because people thought I was trying to position myself within the movement and they were being territorial, right? And, and, and I saw this in how they reacted to me. That's the way they, well, I know some of them, just said exactly to me, you're trying to get my, you know, the people who are paying tithe to me, you want to get them to pay tithe to you, you want to get control, you want to take over my position, right? And and of course, I had no intention of doing any of that. Not interested at all. I do whatever God asked me to do, and what other people want to do, they can do. But never have I put myself in a position to try to take somebody else's territory. I'm not a territorial person. I just trust that God's going to take care of me. I, I don't need to trust in man. But but this is the situation that M. L. Andreasen is in at this point. And, and we need to understand this. Like, this is not some amazing thing to do. This is the Christian thing to do. Right? This is what's happening. This is what happening then, and it's happening now today, Theodore. With, you know, as I said, um, God wants unity. The devil wants disunity. Basically, Conrad Vine's got his opinion. Now he can have his opinion. This Ivor Myers can have his opinion. Uh, you know, the Bible says, "Come, let us reason together." Mm-hmm. And uh, again, we, we've got the, the the practical, the the political, and the practical that you're talking about here. It's um, to be honest, is is um, is foreign to some of these people because they see your honesty as uh, as a threat, uh, and they don't understand it. And this is why we've got what we've got in the world now. We've got different people. The, the Bible is very basic um, on if you've got something to say, go and talk to the person direct. But other people don't see it that way. Yeah, because if you're a person who who shows a false face, um, you assume that other people are as well. Amen. Right. So, you know, so you're going to assume that other people are have those same type of reasons. So you don't even trust other people. If, if you're not trustworthy, you're also not trusting. 
right? Somebody who's un, who's who's not trustworthy is also not trusty. Amen. You know, crim criminals are not very trusty. <laughs> Amen. Right. And um, so so we need to be aware of these these principles. Uh, he says, I've had three delegations come to me to plead. I already read that. Uh, yeah. So he says, to that at, I answer that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and that I'm not interested in starting any movement and that I do not care for the support of any who hold such views. They are not the kind of material that will stand in the coming crisis. Now, so this is a funny, funny thing, funny in a silly, weird way. It's that... I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I agree with him. Right? I don't believe in starting a new movement or a new church or a new organization. I don't believe that that's the solution. Now, Conrad Vine sort of implied that, you know, we should have some sort of parallel conference within the church is what I understand that he said. But I haven't heard his actual message yet. I've just listened to what other people have said that he said, those that support him and those that oppose him. But, you know, I believe, and I believe this for 40 years, that in the end times, Christ's church, his body, is going to work in perfect harmony, not because of the institutions of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but because those members that are connected with him, that Christ will orchestrate and, and, and have them work in a united way. Now, like some people talk about, well, we have gospel order. You know, we should follow gospel order. And this was part of what was happening within this movement with Parminder and Jeff when they were, you know, did the baptismal vows and they're seeking to start this sort of new organization, which which I was opposed to, by the way. And uh, I, I saw it as quite, well, naive and foolish and a number of other things I could attach to it, sort of adjectives. Um but the main thing is it's quite clearly contrary to the spirit of prophecy. And my belief is that Seventh-day Adventists need to be reformed. The Seventh-day Adventist church as an organization is not going to be reformed. It's been passed by, right? But God's people are still, we still are Seventh-day Adventists. And Amen. we don't, our relationship to the church, whether we're in the church, out of the church, is immaterial what matters is our connection with Christ. Amen. Right? That, that's that's all that matters. If the church, our church members accept us and we're part of the church and we can participate in the church, that's fine. But if they don't want to have anything to do with it, do with us, that's fine as well. But we need to recognize that where the problem lies, the, the only place that I have control over is my relationship with Christ. And there's a huge amount of power in that that's that's more powerful than the human power and authority of church boards and conferences. And and somehow people think that I need to I need to convince the church. I need to have the conference. I need the, the church board or the general conference to somehow to pay attention to this idea because they have all this power and, you know, we need it. Right. That's, this is what um, Jesus' brothers uh, were coming to him to say. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it, true. It's something, that, um, Theodore, in the last days, the, the 144,000, if they are seven Adventists, are they going to be part of the church structure? And I'd say no, because when two or three go in my, his name, he's in the midst of us. And basically, um, God is preparing that 144,000 now, I believe. And what, <laughs> you're, what you're talking about now is the most important. He's not, he's not moulding a church, he's moulding a character. And that character is, this is why we need to keep focusing on him. Because if we become like him, we will, won't even realise that we'll be part of that movement. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so I know there's a lot of people who sympathise with Conrad Vine. I personally don't, because I think that he's, if he was preaching the message that we need to be connected to Christ, and not worry about what the church is doing. That to me would be the correct message because our salvation isn't in the church, right? In the organization. We know that the organization will not survive the end time events. It will cease to exist at some point, exactly when I don't know. Depends a little bit on, on the church's decisions. 
and, and it'll probably vary in different parts of the world and different conferences. But our connection with Christ can never be severed. Amen. You know, no man can sever it. So Christ's church will always be there. And, and this brings up, you know, a lot of issues and problems and things of controversy. You know, when I was, as I was talking about uh, with, um, I was at, I guess, when is that now? It's like two weeks ago already when I was at uh, my nephew's wedding and uh, talking with the pastor there. Now, conservative pastor believes in, you know, the 144,000 in the final generation reflecting Christ's character. But, you know, I pressed him with a lot of questions. I wanted to really just see where he stood on these types of issues. And he was very sensitive over the issue of any criticism toward the church. And, you know, I understand it. I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I wasn't really trying to be critical of the church, but he perceived some of these things were. But my, my focus has never been on the church as an organization. I, I never really joined the organization, per se, even when I got baptized. I didn't really care about it. It wasn't a concern of mine. But pastor just said, well, you know, you get baptized, you know, you're going to be a part of this this organization. So, well, that's fine, you know, I guess, you know, I can't do anything about it. I just want to be connected to Christ. That's why I wanted to be baptized. I understood what the Bible says about baptism. But, you know, if people believe that somehow we have to stay with the ship or be part of the church or the church as an organization has to go through. And then it brings up all these issues of tithes and offerings and, you know, what do we do about all this kind of stuff? And, um, you know, he had brought up the thing about, uh, uh, I don't think it was him. It was another guy I was talking with. It wasn't the pastor, but another guy, um, you know, well, the widow paid her two mites and she was praised, you know, for doing that. And of course, uh, we, we know that what she did is she gave out of her, her poverty instead of the rich giving out of their abundance. But he was trying to use this as, well, we still need to give our money to the conference, even if it's being abused. And and I don't find that that is, uh, I and mean, I don't want to talk about tithe, like the issue to me, it's all, what I'm saying is it's a personal issue that each of you have to decide. But but I don't think it, that we have to pay the tithe to the conference. You know, that's my personal view. You don't have to agree with me. And, and I know that Ellen White didn't always do so. And she redirected other people's tithes to places where it needed to go. But we are going to be in a position, whether what you think about tithe one way or the other, where there is not going to be an organization to give tithe to. Doesn't mean that you don't pay tithe at all. You, you have to use that. What, you know, what God has given you according to how God directs you personally. Um, but some people are of the position that, you know, there's nothing you can do. You have to pay chop tithe to church no matter what the church does, right? So all of these things to me are these side issues that people get caught up in, you know, if, if we want to talk about distractions, mm -hmm. from really the main issue that we need to be connected to Christ, and that we shouldn't be judging other people if they don't agree with us on some of these issues, right? Okay. Some people think other people have to think the same way they do about tithes or whatever, these sort of issues about the church. But if we can focus upon the fact that, well, no matter what happens, as long as I'm connected to Christ and obeying his voice, um, I can trust that he can take care of these things that I have no control over. I was speaking okay. to Junie this morning, Theodore, about um, yeah. as ad, Adventist, right? Adventist messages to get out of the cities and into the country. And then as mm -hmm. the as the cities get worse, we get further out into the countries where we're beside the forest. So in the last days, we have to rely on God. So we're relying on God. When we first, when I first became Adventist, uh, I told you this story. The song "He Lives" came in my head. And basically, I've always followed a living saviour who's in the world today, who guiding everyone if we'll just listen. But we need to do our part. And our part is, as we were saying before, is get out of the cities. You, you know, it's very hard to sit, see and hear God when you're in the city and got all people walking past and cars and buildings. Whereas in the country, when you're looking at the trees and you've got that peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guide your heart and mind, you can hear God guiding you. And I believe this this what we're talking about the character 
is all being molded by a people who God is molding. And it's it's only we do it by beholding become changed. Yeah. And this is what we're talking about near with what talking about Andreasen. Someone sent me something on Conrad Vine. I said the same thing. I said, I'm not sure where this goes yet because it's uh, it's it's another distraction. God is guiding a people. We need to most make sure no matter what happens, we don't take our focus off Christ and being Christ-like. Yeah. Yeah. So and 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 we need to allow that people make their own decisions. I mean, obviously, I don't believe in raising children in the city. I mean, I raised my children in the country. I do live technically in a city, though it's pretty rural type of city. It's uh, really what most people would call a town. But uh, but I know the, the Africans, when I show them pictures of, of Leduc, they're like, well, that doesn't look like a city at all. Because to them, a city doesn't have trees and lakes and rivers and, and valleys and, and walking paths. And, you know, city to them is, uh, you know, pretty much devoid of, of any sort of plant life, some of the cities in, in places in Africa. The but, problem, uh, the problem yeah. here is when you're in, in a small town, but there's going to be a time where you're going to have to go to the forest. When, when the, uh, oh, yeah. stuff. And see, for you in where you are now, if you bring the city people to your place, they wouldn't be happy because they don't have all the conveniences. You know, it, it, the story always is people go to the country and then oh, it's, I have to drive so far to go and get something to eat. I have to drive so far for this. Whereas the peace that God is trying to teach mankind, his people, is that the peace is with him. And mm-hmm. being in the country, you have that peace that you're happy to look at the beautiful trees and, you know, happy to walk across the fields. Um, you and, have gardens, too, in there. You can have gardens gardens in the country, too, a grow garden. Yeah. Amen. Well, you can grow gardens in, in this type of city that I live in, too. But, uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're making it harder and harder to grow gardens. They're making the yards smaller and ho- smaller and the houses bigger and bigger. I don't know if you notice that. Okay. So anyway, let's go up and read it here again. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist rejoicing in the truth. Right and truth will triumph in the end. I'm hoping that as the truth of the present situation becomes known, there will be men and women who will protest and exert influence enough to affect certain changes in our organization that will ensure men in holy office that are faithful to the truth once delivered to the saints. I end this with a hearty greeting to all. My next letter on the matter of a hearing should be an interesting one till then. May the dealer be with you. Now it's kind of interesting when you think about what happened here. So we know about the evangelical conferences. And so we're going to have uh, the fourth generation arrive in 1957 with the publication of the book Questions on Doctrine. So my understanding of this, the four generations of Adventism is the first generation is from 1844 to 1888. And the second generation is from 1888 to 1919. And 1919 is going to introduce the books of a new order, that is uh, the doctrine of Christ. And then that third generation is going to end with uh, a book of the new order, Questions on doctrine, right? So it kind of bookends uh, the doctrine part, uh, that period of the third generation. Then the fourth generation arrives in 1957. And it's in the fourth generation that the time of the end occurs. And you can see this in all the progressive destructions of four. A simple one would be the first four churches, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, and Thyatira, it's in the time of Thyatira uh, that you're going to have the time of the end, right? And and so that reform line that starts in 1798 is going to start in the time of the fourth generation. And the same happens in our history in the time of the fourth generation at the end of that period of time, 1989, we're going to have a time of the end, right? So, so we can see that what's happening here in this history that, that's going to be following is going to be what he's talking about. That there is going to be people rising up. Robert Pearson, I think that's the guy's name, who was the conference president in the 1970s, uh, just prior to me becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. And they they had quite a strong influence on counteracting uh, some of this new theology that had come in from 1957. And we have ministers who are preaching the truth, 
And the church has this opportunity uh, to repent, right? They have that opportunity. But what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to have Desmond Ford, so you could kind of see 1980, August uh, 10th to 15th, uh, 1980. You're going to have uh, the Glacier View Conference where Desmond Ford is going to, on August 15th, he's going to have his credentials. They vote to have his credentials removed. And um, um, it seems like, you know, they're, they're moving in a direction that's positive. But what in, what's going to happen is Satan starts to see Satan is the one who works behind the scenes. He's the one who works practically, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So, so all kinds of things are happening um, in the 80s. So you have uh, different movements that are trying to con- correct the church. But you have a liberal faction, which is mostly our educated class, um, running the Review and Herald, and uh, lots of liberal ideas being introduced uh, through the 80s. You have um, uh, people like George R. Knight writing the book 1888 to Apostasy about A.T. Jones. Uh, the issue of 1888, Righteousness by Faith, becomes a really hot topic. The nature of Christ specifically, some of these groups like Hope International and so forth are really pressing the issues. The church is going to publish a book called Issues, attacking uh, Hope International, Heartland Institute, and uh, one other organization. I can't remember what they're called. Steps to Life, these three organizations that were uh, taking tithe away from the church. That was really their main concern is that they were using tithe money to support their own ministry. They sort of had a parallel conference, if you want to look at it, at least in the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Midwest. And um, so, uh, or Northwest, Pacific Northwest. So, so we had all of these types of things happening. But when the time of the end arrives, the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to be passed by. At least the leadership is going to be passed by. So the light that's going to come to this generation, does it come from the leadership in any reform line? No. No, no I didn't, didn't see it. Yeah, so it, it comes from, so from another group, right? I mean, you can look in the time of Christ, right? The disciples aren't the leadership of the Jewish church. So, so we're going to have Jeff Pippinger being raised up like Miller was. And Jeff is going to uh, be given light about the time of the end. He's going to understand Lewis F. Weir's Daniel 11, verse 40b, but he's also going to mark it as the time of the end, something Lewis F. Weir wouldn't have thought of. And he's going to understand the repeat of Millerite history. And that's the main, that's the first angel's message in our history is that understanding of Millerite history. That's going to come. And then at 9-11, um, so the institution is passed by. So we have leadership passed by. That is, light is going to come from the labor, right? Not from the, the professional theologian. Light is going to come from, you know, guy who does drywall or plastering or something like that, whatever he did as a, as a job, right? Somebody who's not... Definitely not important within the church. And, but at 9 11, the church itself is passed by. Now, what's the difference between the leadership being passed by? Why is 9 11 uh, a different? How, how do we understand these waymarks, 1989 and 9 11? Any thoughts on that? I mean, this was talked about a lot in the movement in the past, you know, at the the leadership was passed by or the church is passed by. And, and I say first, our theologians are passed by to receive light. So what particularly happens at 9-11 that's different? And, and this was misused by the movement, by the way. So that's why they wanted to start a new, a new organization. What, what's happening at 9-11? So 1989, we have the fulfillment of prophecy. What, what's that, Kelly? It was a worldwide event rather than just within an internal event within the church that was supposed okay. to be noticed. Where, where the church brought in spiritual formation. 
Okay. Yeah. So that that's that becomes a marker. So that's a marker. One is where we see uh, uh, the dragon power, the UN, also making uh, connections. So we have something happening within the church that's being paralleled within uh, the United States itself. So there's a parallel um, kingdoms we call them, right? So we have this this the, this the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and we have the United States. Okay, but in 1989, we had a prophecy. We had Louis F. Weir, who made a prediction. And that prophecy was fulfilled, right? And yet the church ignores it, right? The church isn't interested in the fact that one of their ministers, another one who was uh, disfellowshipped like Andreasen was, uh, you know, he, he, we had all of this light, and yet, the only ones who notice it are unimportant people, right? Now, of course, I was studying Louis F. Weir as well, right? That's one of the, the things that made Jeff's message att attractive is it, it was filling in uh, pieces of information that I partly understood, but there was things I was missing. And the idea was the time of the end and the repeat of Millerite history. I just understood that Daniel 11 verse 40 B had been fulfilled. But then we have uh, at 9-11, we have the second angel arrive. Okay. Now, so we had the first angel arrive, and the group that's being tested is the Seventh Day Adventist leadership, right? That's who's being tested in that period from 1989 to 911. They have that opportunity to to hear this message, just like Protestants were tested in the first angel's message in Millerite history, and so. So we're going to see then um, when the second angel arrives, that group is passed by. That is, we can see that the way that I would put it is that the Seventh-day Adventist church, its relationship to the message, we're, we're not looking to reform the institution, the church. We're looking to reform Seventh-day Adventists. So now who is being tested is not the leadership but Seventh-day Adventists are being tested under the second angel's message. That, that's my understanding. So, and the, and the reason why I bring all this up is because you can see here at this point where Andreasen is, he's in that fourth generation. It's appropriate for him to be saying what he's saying. That, you know, maybe there could be this influence that it can affect certain changes in our organization. Are we looking for that to happen in our time? Are we we expecting that the church is going to be reformed? No, no, no. Oh, no, it's deformed. Yeah, it, it it it's it's going to dissolve the institution, right? So so it's appropriate for him at that time to be taking the position that he does, but it wouldn't be appropriate for us to take that position after nine eleven. Now. That curse could be taken, you know, as heresy by many Seventh Day Adventists who really believe that that the organization is going to be reformed. I believe that Seventh Day Adventists, as individuals, are going to be reformed and reformed to be connected with Christ, so that He will have His Church operating and functioning uh, to give that message to the world and that the institution will not do it. And my view is, and you know, we've, we've done studies on this, but my, my view is that the Seventh-day Adventist church will be involved in promoting uh, the observance of the first day of the week. Amen. Right. And, and, and why, why is that? Well, one is we see that they tend to compromise and we've talked about this before, 2017. Uh, I've been compromising for I've been compromising for years. Yeah, and they they what? they did it in Russia, right? So they wouldn't lose their institutions, right? So they believe that that they that they need to keep these institutions going in order to do the work of the church, and so they will compromise to keep the institutions, and they will do that in the Sunday law crisis, is my view at least most conferences. 
they're going to compromise. There might be some conferences that don't. I mean, right? compromising since 1919, at least. Well, yeah, the compromise has, has been slow and gradual, but they have had opportunity many times, just like the Jews did under the four or seven times. They have opportunity to turn, but there comes a point in which even if they had begun to keep the, the Sabbath and Jubilee cycles, they would not have diverted uh, the destruction that was coming up on Jerusalem, right? It was too late. And, and I believe for the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization, it's, it's too late for that organization to be reformed, but it's not too late for Seventh-day Adventists. And so our message is not to the organization. We're not seeking to, to, you know, to talk to our ministers and convince our conferences and our leadership uh, to change course. So, you know, in what, what Andreasen is doing, and we look at it, I mean, he's doing the right thing. Amen. But that right thing is different in different times. So we're, so we're not trying to re reform the organization. We're not, we're not seeking to, to do anything practical, that's for sure, you know, political. Um, but just do what God asks us to do each day. Trust that he can, you know, I sometimes struggle over it because we do all of these studies and I think, well, you know, there's not many people in the world watching what we're doing. And we're definitely not important people. We're pretty insignificant. But there's a lot of power in studying together. Uh, the upper room studies that we had when I was, you know, First an Adventist, you know, in the, in the mid 1980s, early 1980s, that 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 group, that Bible study group, which which this reminds me of, uh, was extremely influential. There's still many solid Adventists who, who have been to those Bible studies. Some of them have passed since then, but it, it had such a powerful influence. And I was going to say, going to say it has been a lifelong influence. In my life, those studies. Yeah, and mine too. But but we know lots of people who are in those studies, and that they're still solid Seventh Day Adventists. Now they're not all in agreement with us on everything here, but uh, there's still lots of people who that was a real difference for them. And and of course, the influence of one person sometimes. Uh, it, it, it can be so far reaching. It's hard. It's hard for us to sometimes grasp. But if you think about some of the great men in the past, and it may not be that, you know, we're the great men, because I doubt that we are. But there may be somebody who hears these truths that God will raise up. I mean, I'm not sure how God's going to do it. All I know is that he's going to do it. Amen. And we have a responsibility, an individual responsibility to obey God, to study the truth, to share the truth, and to trust that God can accomplish what he says his word will accomplish. But but often man looks for, you know, uh, uh, human solutions to the problems. Like, let's start a new conference. Let's start a new church. Let's, let's start a new organization. And so the nice thing about Andreasen is – People are saying, well, let's let's start a new organization. Let's let's start a new movement. I mean, he's recognizing that that is wrong because that's always wrong. Right. To be connected with Christ, to be faithful to his truth and to to be a Seventh Day Adventist, a true Seventh Day Adventist. There's nothing to do with an organization or church membership. Amen. I can see what we've been studying here, Theodore, is basically um, a parallel all the way through. You know, when I got baptized, I got baptized to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but I didn't realize, but I, and I probably don't realize it. As I said, God put in my head the, the song, he, li he, um, he Lives, so I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. And I believe he's been leading me through all the different churches. And what I'm seeing here. Andreasen is is same thing. He's got his mind stayed on Christ, and we all need to keep our mind stayed on Christ. Then, as we're just saying, everything will be changed by what he leads us to and how we handle it. If we see error, we need to say it. We need to be honest, and doesn't matter what happens. But God is that that hundred and forty four thousand 
follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. So basically, that's what we need to be doing, being led by Jesus Christ. And he is our leader and he'll take us through. We need to do the, the things we're doing, get into the country, get away from the city, not get caught up in the distractions of the church. Looks like the church is always looking for a leader, but the leader is Jesus Christ. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we start looking to man for any leadership, we look at way marks on the way. Um, God will guide us. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, the 144,000 follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And if we if we don't see the lamb in our brothers and sisters, we've got a problem. And the, 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 the brothers and sisters will see the lamb in each other and have that love one to another. So, so a, an in, interesting thought here. So when we started, we were talking about like the criticism of individuals and, and how that's not profitable. But I also do not believe that it's profitable to criticize the church. Now, we need to understand the, the, the problems that exist within the church. But some people make their whole message about the problems that's in the church, how bad the, the church is, all the different sins that are going on, whether it's worship music or, you know, other kinds of doctrinal errors and so forth. But that does that bears the same type of fruit as when we judge the individual. Right. Because why do we judge individuals and why do we judge the church? Why do we like talking about how bad the church is? Why do we like talking about how bad other people are? If we do, we're not on God's side, Theodore. But, but why? It takes, why, the, it takes why, the guilt off. It takes the guilt off ourselves. Amen. Right. So what we're trying to do is instead of dealing with ourselves, the problem is out there, right? So, so for the seven days, for seven day Adventists, my perspective is. You know, the Catholic Church is bad. So some people really like to talk about how bad the Catholic Church is, right? Because they're bad. I'm good, right? That That's kind of the message that's often really given, right? Or the perspective that, that happens. Or the church is bad. So some people focus on the church. Some people focus on individuals. But where we really need to see, where we really, really need to focus is, Getting to know Christ, because when we get to know Christ, he will reveal to us our sins, the things that have to change. And that's where the power is going to be. And you can see, you know, conspiracy theories, theories all these things that are happening in the world, if they absorb our attention, they're spiritually deadening. The problems in the church, if that's our conversation, that's spiritually deadening, Amen. you know. If our criticism is, is of other individuals and how bad they are, that's spiritual deadening. But to behold Christ, to study his word, to look for truth, to, to be, receive conviction for your own sins, that's where there is true power. And that is spiritually enlivening. That is, uh, that's where revival comes from. It starts with the individual. Amen. God is guiding a people theater. I'll just give a quick story here. I was at my brother-in-law's place oh, many years ago, 10 years ago now, and he's Pentecostal. And he was telling me all the reasons that I'm wrong and he's right. And I'm praying and praying, God, give me the answer. Give me the answer what I need to answer him. And I got nothing. I went out there with my tail between my legs thinking, well, you know, I got in the car. All the answers came into my head, what I could have said to him. And I said, well, God, why didn't you tell me when I was there? And then basically he showed me the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not appointed us to wrath to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to understand God has got a, a work to do and we need just to walk, walk along with him. He will do it. The same as when Jesus was here. When Jesus was here, he of himself, he did nothing. God, Jesus came to be our example. We need to follow his example and be led. This is why we need to be listening, walking and talking with God. I've, I've mentioned this in this group a few times now. We have a living God. We need to have that relationship with Jesus that, that Jesus had, where he can tell us what we need to do and what we need to say and when we need to keep our mouth closed. <laughs> and, th and that will bring us into unity with those that are connected with Christ. Amen. And his church is going to be a powerful force because of the connection with Christ. Amen. That is the only way we can become truly connected with each other is through Christ. Okay. 
Any any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have had here uh, on this Sabbath, and uh, we pray for tomorrow uh, for the studies here in the morning. I just I'm so thankful that um, you are teaching us these things and that they're becoming clear in our minds. Lord, we entrust our lives to thee. We trust that you can take care of these situations that we have no control over and that we can be faithful in the little things that you give us to do and know that you are working your mighty work throughout this world through all kinds of individuals working upon their hearts. And we're so thankful that we're seeing these things now. I'm thankful, Lord, personally, that uh, at the Upper Room Bible Studies, when I first became an Adventist, the things that you that you showed us in those studies, that we're, we're being able to see them uh, in action today around us. We can see that Christ is coming soon. And we know, Lord, that we are not ready. We just ask that you can help us each day, and especially on this Sabbath, to have an experience with you that we can be assured uh, that you will be with us as we trust in you in spite of what we see around us. Bless each person. We ask that you can give them health where they need healing. We pray for our families, our loved ones who are suffering in various ways. And we pray for those, Lord, that we we have opportunity to share with, that you can give us words of encouragement and that you can help us to reflect Christ's character and how we deal with others. Forgive us for our sins, your righteousness. And we pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.